Well, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we're hungry for your presence. We're hungry to see Jesus. We just acknowledge, Lord, that if you would reveal yourself and show up in power, we will go out and see your kingdom break through. And that's what we're asking you to do here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anyone in the back booth there? Yeah. See those things? I like to see people. Just a little bit. All right. The title of today's message is, Goliath Will Fall. Imagine a man comes home, comes in his door, and he hears his wife screaming. Immediately, adrenaline pumps through his body. He runs into the room, and he sees a man with a knife over top of her, about to do her harm. He runs over in his whole body, feet firmly planted, moving at the hips, his fist strikes the guy in the jaw and knocks him out. You expect that this morning, Pastor Dave? I see him laughing. In that moment when he sees that intruder passed out and sees that his family is secured and that everyone is safe, he's th giving thanks to God saying, Thank you, Lord, for bringing deliverance and salvation. It's an interesting I thought about what can happen, right? Well, this is a picture of the world in danger being killed by sin. And the deliverance that is possible through Jesus Christ, but especially now through his body on earth. Isn't that an interesting idea? Now think about this for a second. What if that hand, that fist, right after that perpetrator is knocked out goes, look at me, I'm the biggest, baddest fist everywhere. I am the one who knocked that guy out. And the rest of the body says, what about me? You didn't do that by yourself. You couldn't have done that by yourself. If the feet would have went on rebellion, if the eyes had not been seeing, if the ears had not been hearing, it wasn't the fist alone that did it. And we're going to make, this is going to be an important point as, as we draw this out. Because as we've been talking, the gospel is a worldwide liberation movement. And there's power in the body of Christ to knock the enemy out. I mean, ultimately, Jesus Christ knocked the enemy out at Calvary when he died for our sins. But that was just the beginning of the mop-up process. And Jesus is completing the total conquest of liberating all human beings on earth, liberating all creation through his body, the church. It's awesome, isn't it? But it requires the body. And without the body, there will be no deliverance. Now, I have to take a step back because when we use language like this, that there is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ to liberate the whole world, a lot of times people will literally go and say, I don't believe that. I really don't believe that. Why? Because the devil is Lord. They don't say that. But in practice, they are saying the devil is Lord. They, they basically believe that we should expect more and more failure on the earth until things get so bad that Jesus has to come and rescue us. Now, this is a real challenge in many ways because if that doctrine is wrong, then what they're doing is they are setting up the church for massive failure. Hear what I'm saying, because as we unpack this message today, you're, we're going to see some things, and, and some of the things we have to discuss is maturity versus immaturity, responsibility versus in, irresponsibility, right? Like the person who Jesus told the parable about that had basically been decimated by robbers, and a Jew walks by, a priest walks by and does nothing. But a Samaritan comes by and takes care of him at his expense. And the message is saying the world is broken, the world is hurting, the people are suffering, and people need set free. Whose responsibility is it? 
if, there, if God has given power through the gospel of Jesus Christ and poured out his Holy Spirit and has anointed us to be his ambassadors on earth, then he's entrusted us with responsibility. And that responsibility is the Great Commission or the Worldwide Liberation Movement. But if we hold to ideas, it's almost like we're not responsible if people have rejected Christ. We're not responsible for this fallen, wicked world. As a matter of fact, this wicked, fallen world is so bad and so evil that they made a giant mess and they need to lie in it. Does that really sound like the heart of the gospel to you? The heart of Jesus Christ for a broken and dying world? When we, when we were talking before the service here about Isaiah 42, and it says that he will bring the victory to justice to the ends of the earth. He will bring justice to the whole world, and the Gentiles shall worship him, right? Justice. He cares about justice. He cares about bringing his reign upon believers and unbelievers alike to show us how good he is, how loving he is, how faithful he is. See the difference we're painting here between these two pictures? But this whole question of when people look at how bad things seem in the world and they look at what we are facing in society today, they often judge by what their eyes see and their ears hear instead of the word of God. And the whole Bible is filled with this challenge of faith again and again and again. I'm giving you this land. If he's giving us this land, then we're going to go take it. Oh, we can't take it. We're grasshoppers in the midst of giants. Right? And this challenge of faith. When we lose faith that there is power in the gospel to set the world free, then what, we are, what we've done is we've cut off the power. The power is there. We're just not plugged in anymore. So, I mean, you could literally turn all to many places in Scripture to talk about this challenge of faith, couldn't you? Even the title, Goliath Will Fall, right? Goliath Will Fall. So I decided to just talk about one passage because I always find these things so intriguing. Human beings say it's impossible. How can, how can we get the word out when we're starting to see book burnings? Oh, I meant just removing them from Kindle. Or silencing opposing voices through big tech. And people will always make a million excuses of why it is impossible. Instead of Elijah saying, oh, you think, you think that? Watch me pour water on the sacrifice. You see what I mean? So I'm going to read from Zechariah 9, 3 to 4. For Tyre... Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like dust and gold like the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea, and she will be devoured by fire. Now, really, right now, that doesn't really... What do you mean, like, a challenge of faith? And this is what's interesting about Scripture and why I like to read Scriptures and sometimes Scriptures where the message is a little obscure at first. Because it teaches us that we need to mine the word. We need to study God's word. We need to ask questions. What in the world are you saying there, God? I don't get it. Well, I don't get it. Moving on. Right? And that's why the Bible is not the only source of knowledge in the earth. And we need to get that and not feel guilty about it. I don't need any other book. I just got the Bible, brother. Well, then you're going to be impoverished. Listen well to what I'm saying. John Wesley impacted culture mightily because not only did he get people passionate about reading the Bible, he, got a, he, he was also known as a peddler of books, and he had like 60 books that he got people reading. And all of knowledge, when it agrees with truth in reality, it belongs to God. History belongs to God. Science belongs to God. We want to open up the book of special revelation, which is the very word of God, where God will speak to us personally. And when we have eaten God's word so much, it starts to come out of us naturally. But then we're hungry to know the Lord also in the things that he created. And not only is it science, 
in technology, but it's also history. Because God rules over history, and when your eyes have been opened through the Word of God, all of a sudden, you see His handiwork everywhere, and you see Him at work everywhere. And you discover that everything in history actually agrees with the Word of God. That when people sin, they suffer. When people sin, things fall apart. When the, or how's the Bible put it? When the wicked rule, the people groan. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. That there actually is justice. It's not social justice. It's biblical justice. And that is what God is promoting on the earth. So anyway, that passage in Zechariah, I'm going to read from the King James Version Bible Commentary. Ancient historians describe the impregnability of the fortress that Tyre built. The walls, 150 feet high and of breadth proportionate, compacted of large stones embedded in gypsum. In order to make the wall twice as strong, they built a second wall 10 cubits broad, leaving a space between of 5 cubits, which they filled with stones and earth. And by the way, they built it on an island. History attests to the city's impregnability, for the Assyrians laid siege to it for five years and failed. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon laid siege to it for 13 years and failed. From a human point of view, Tyre was justified in her great pride and confidence. Tyre had not taken into account that the Lord will cast her out. At the word of the Lord you shall fall. Isn't that awesome? I mean, there's this giant tower of Tyre. And, and you know what? It, things are, don't happen in a vacuum. All the surrounding nations know nobody can take Tyre. Look how he took out the Assyrians and the Babylonians. It's the mighty tower of Tyre. It's impenetrable. And not only is it impenetrable, but they've heaped up gold and silver like the dust or the dirt in the street. Meaning we can buy soldiers to come and help us and we can buy food and we can withstand a 13-year siege. In every way from a human perspective, it is impossible to take that tower. And at the word of the Lord, the tower fell. God spoke it and it happened. And in, I think it was seven months, Alexander the Great took it. And the word of the Lord was fulfilled. Isn't that awesome? And so what it teaches us is that when God speaks, he is able to bring to pass things that seem impossible. There is nothing in the world that we're facing today that isn't, as, isn't more powerful than trying to take out that tower. 13 years by Nebuchadnezzar. Come on. It could withstand all of that, and yet God speaks and it will fall. See, you need to feed on God's word like this a little bit when you're looking at all the towers in this earth. And you say, wow, it's impossible. We're just grasshoppers in a land of giants, the Twitter giant, the Facebook giant, and the federal government giant, and list all the giants that you can think of. And that's what happened with Israel, wasn't it? There's a giant mocking us and we're all like little grasshoppers and we can't do anything. And a little shepherd boy comes along who knows that we are the covenant people of God. He said he didn't see what you see in the eyes of the flesh, nor did he. He's like, oh, wow, this is my opportunity to make a name for myself. You know, like, look it, I'll take out the big guy and everybody will know I can take out the big guy. No, he understood that it was a clash of kingdoms. In the press of kingdom of the Philistines versus the kingdom of God through the covenant people of God. He knew what was at stake and he knew that the glory and honor of God was also at stake. He said, you come to me with swords and spears, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. This day I will cut off your head with your sword. That is bold, radical faith in the covenant promises of God. And that is what causes giants to fall. Isn't that awesome? So we are facing giant evil and darkness in our generation. And the question is whether the king seated forever on David's throne can take him out. It's not really a question, is it? 
It's almost rude to even ask it. But that's what we need to ask ourselves. Do we believe? Because the second question is, how will he do it? How will he do it? And that brings us to the next point. The hidden power of Christ in the church. How has God ordained giants to fall? It's Jesus is going to take them out. And he's going to do it through his body. So that's what we're exploring today. How will the giants of this present age fall? Oh, they will fall. There's no question about it. Christ is King and Lord forever. And God's word says that he is seated on his throne until every enemy is put under his feet. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. That settles it. It's not a question whether the giants will fall. It says there's a kingdom that will come in the days of the Roman Empire. And it will strike the image and utterly destroy it. And that kingdom will be everlasting. Was that a promise that communist nations won't rise? That atheism won't sweep sections of the world? No. It's a promise that when, you know, by the dawn's early light, when there was constant warfare in an impossible situation, when the sun rises, there's the flag still flying. We know that we hit that flag again and again with direct cannon blasts. How is it still standing? It's being held up by the bodies of patriots that are holding it up because they understood what that flag represents. It's moving, isn't it? There's no question that we know that the kingdom of God shall not be overcome. He says, you know, Jesus is Lord. He sits in heaven and he laughs when the nations rage in vain and they plot a vain thing. Isn't that awesome? But it really comes down to like the book of Esther. I mean, that testimony of Mordecai is the testimony of faith. Esther, don't think for a second, just because you're in the king's palace, you'll be safe if this genocide happens. But know this, salvation will come for the Jews because I know God's word and I know his promises and I know his character and he's faithful. But as for you and your father's house, we will perish in it. So it, it's, it's so many things in this battle of faith is which, what generation will inherit? What generation will break through? It's not a promise against dark times or suffering or evil in the earth. But it is a promise that when the dust settles from this war, the kingdom of God and his banner over the nations will be flying. In Christ will prevail. That's exciting, isn't it? It's exciting. So the hidden power. Oh, it's just so. I just can't stop going off this rapid trail. It's like we know when. I mean, there's so many things in scripture are there. Joseph, when I die, make a covenant with me that you'll take me to the promised land. Because in 400 years, God's going to visit you and bring you out of here. Right? And now he says, I'm going to bring you into this land. I will do it. And a generation rises up and says, we can't enter because we're like grasshoppers in a land of giants. Uh, I guess we aborted the kingdom. I guess everybody was right. The devil wins. No. That generation perished in the wilderness. But God still brought them in. So it's not a promise that we will prevail without faith. It's not a promise that we won't see dark times if we lose faith. But it is a promise that Christ will have a bride that is pure, spotless, immature. That we will come, the church will come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That will surely come to pass. But the question is, will will we be a generation that enters in? Or will we be a generation that fails to enter in because we don't mix it with faith? It's a challenge, isn't it? 
So when people keep feeding on things that make you believe the giant is too big and we're just grasshoppers, we become part of the problem. But when we look to God's word, you know, we start to get faith and boldness and confidence and fearlessness and the very things that are needed and necessary to prevail start to awaken in us. And that's why we come to church Sunday after Sunday to feed on God's word because it strengthens us, it empowers us, it equips us. But I really am excited. I realize I'm going long today, but there's not a lot of people here, so oops. <laughs> we'll be, maybe we'll be all right. I, I, I actually just did two pages because I said I got to keep cutting it down. And then temptation of rabbit trails. They're dangerous things. The hidden power of the body of Christ. Getting back to where I left off. Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I started in the middle of the passage to save time. But... This really is such an awesome vision that we are going to grow up in all things into the head, which is Christ. God's vision is not that we every week try to get people saved. God's vision is that we get people born again and mature in Christ. Born again and mature in Christ. And all throughout God's word, he promises, I will bring the church to maturity. But he says, I have ordained maturity to come through this process of every member doing their part. That God has invested a gift or multiple gifts in every member of the body of Christ. And if they are either not present in the community, if they're not connected in the community of believers, then the people of God are being robbed. Or if they're gathered, but they are playing spectators Christianity, then they are being robbed. And this is not to meant to be a guilt trip. It's meant to be it's, it's kind of a weird thing because realizing the value of what God has entrusted you with is dignifying, isn't it? It's dignifying. But there's so many things that go on with all of this. And let me see how I can make this quicker. Okay. I remember when I, I was sharing this, gosh, I don't remember where the other day. And so some of you are going to hear it again. Oh, it's Tuesday Night Life Group. I remember, well, first I'll go back a step. When we follow the Lord, one of the most exciting things is when we start to discover new things in Scripture. Right? And it's just a matter of fact, for some reason, God has made us that we always feel like, wow, I can't believe that, we, that there could be any more in Scripture because it's so glorious what I can see in Scripture right now. And then he reveals more to you. And that's like a journey for your whole life. And it's exciting and it never grows tiresome and it never grows boring, right? But I remember when God was revealing these truths, it's like there's a light that quickens and stirs it because we've got a passion. How do we take out Goliath? How do we win in the world? How do we bring a worldwide liberation movement into fruition? And I started studying these scriptures and I got so excited because I said, I can see it. I can see it. We win. We win. We just need to get the whole body of Christ doing what God has called them to do. Empowering them and equipping them to do it. And I was so excited and God says, yes, yeah, son, but you don't quite see the whole picture. Right? No, exactly. Right? You're like, what? Well, that doesn't make sense. It's there in God's word. Yes, it is. And so God used to speak a lot, now it's still regularly, but not as often in dreams. But sometimes when he needs to get your attention and you're not listening, he'll just give you a dream. So he gave me a dream. And in the dream, I was in this midst of a people and I was teaching these truths and I was on fire with these truths. And after I presented them, these elders got up and started contradicting it with things that I knew were completely false. 
And I was ready to light in because I knew that I had the word to counter it. And an angel came to me in the dream, put his hand on me and pulled me out of there. And he said, no, no. Because he goes, they've already made their choice. They don't want the responsibility. Isn't that crazy? And that was actually, and this was years after really me, profoundly meeting the Lord. But from, from the moment I met the Lord, I kept having these dreams that all had the same theme. Sometimes there'll be numbers of years in between. But each one, the, dream, the one was very clear. I was in that, a city built in the, in the trees and it was, you know, obviously tons of labor was put into it. But when I got into the city, the, the, the paths were narrow and the railings were really short. And I was walking on this thing going, man, you could easily fall off of here and die. This doesn't make any sense. Why would you build this thing so foolishly? And as I was pondering that question, it was like a light bulb went off. This whole thing is designed to keep people in immaturity. And I said that out loud and this door opened up and again it was these elders came out. Do you have a problem with this? And they were really intimidating and I was going to get intimidated. So then the Lord caused trouble and I said, I'm getting off this thing. And went through the wilderness and I found a bunch of people and we started praying. And then I saw an army of God gather. So when I say that the church is often structured to keep people in immaturity, this is very serious stuff. And people don't think about it because it's not just like automatic. We come to Christ and we go to church and then we become mature. If you really pay attention, some people can go to church every Sunday and go to a life group every week and still never mature, never be transformed, never have their life radically transformed. Because it only happens when the body is released. And everybody's doing their part. Right? Now these things, I remember it was, Pastor Ted saw me working with another friend of mine. We were, you know, he was a long-termer out in front of Planned Parenthood. And so we would go down to Planned Parenthood and try to do a witness outside of Planned Parenthood every week. And so I started going with them. But they made, you know, we had to have our witness very far away from the front of the building. And they had a whole parking lot, so they could just drive by us and go in and never see us. And I remember kept thinking to myself, hey, we're not getting to talk to anybody. We're not getting to reach anybody. This silent witness, I want to see, I want a person. So we started preaching to them as they were going in. Right? And, and it was in me and I brought a buddy that I labored together with in the kingdom. And we were saying, listen, that child in you is not the end of your life. If, if you're feeling even a little bit of concern, then we just ask you to at least come and talk to us. We want you to know what your choices actually are. We want you to know what opportunities there are for you before you make your choice. Like that, that was the kind of message that me and my buddy were preaching. Boom, 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 boom. And I'll never forget it because I was still pretty young in the Lord. And Pastor Ted pulled me aside afterwards. He said, what you have is very special there. What are you talking about? He goes, most ministers don't operate, because I was already in ministry by then. He said, most ministers don't operate like that because they're too concerned about their own territory and about their name and reputation rather than being a team that are gathered to fulfill a purpose, rejoicing that the team wins. It becomes about me and my house. And so a lot of times what happens is it's like, we, I mean, we don't even think about, it. oh, the man of God or the women of God, whenever they're, pre and we put them up on pedestals. You know, they're holy and well, I'm not. They're mighty and God can use them and I'm not. And I'm like, no, the fist, if he says, look at me, I'm the biggest, baddest fist ever. The fist can punch nothing. It actually has no power without the hips. Can't punch anything without the arm. Kind of be hard to do if you're blind. You know, you got to have your feet planted or it's going to be a pretty weak punch. You see what I'm saying? We can't take out the enemy without the whole body. It is foolishness. And, and so we see this all the time. God has given gifts to his body, but they're all different. But not one gift is more important than the other. 
Not one gift is more important than the other. There is no, there is no victory without the whole body. And we have to realize that and understand it and get out of spectator Christianity. Does that make sense? And if we really realize it, I, I like to talk about we're ambassadors of Christ. What, are, what is an ambassador? They represent a government, right? The government of Podunkville. I'm the ambassador of Podunkville, and people are like, I don't care. I'm the ambassador of the United States of America. Oh, 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 wait a minute. I'm paying attention. Why? Because there's a whole economy. There's a whole military behind you. You see what I'm saying? We are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. But his kingdom is manifested in his church. And when the church is healthy, it is a powerful force in the earth. And history proves it. Whole cultures whole nations have been transformed through the power of healthy church. Isn't that exciting stuff? It's really exciting stuff. Now, there's a couple things here because we've really been talking about the worldwide liberation movement, right? How do we liberate the world? Because we know that liberation comes through Jesus Christ, right? So that first part is that the body needs to come to maturity. See, I keep saying, transform the church, transform the world. It really is that simple. So Paul talks about the groaning of all creation for deliverance. All of creation is groaning. Come and say, we need sa saving God. Look, God, we need saving. How is salvation going to come? Oh, you poor groaning creation. You need to groan even worse. You need to become even more wretched and miserable. You got you to gotta just be covered in just total misery. And then I'll come back and save you. No, Paul says it like this. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation seems to know what many Christians don't know. We're going to be delivered. We're going to be transformed. We're going to be liberated. Liberation is coming. It's like the allied forces are coming. How, how are they coming? They're coming... When the sons and daughters of God are revealed on the earth, that means mature Christians, mature believers. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. So I call this the principle of maturity. Galatians 4, 1 through 2 says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the appointed time of the father. Isn't that an interesting passage? Get rid of the water. So it says an heir. Though this child is the heir of the kingdom, he doesn't differ at all from a slave. It's not until he comes to maturity that you discover he's an heir of the kingdom. An heir of the king. And that's telling us we need to bring the saints to maturity. But we also have to understand that this principle of maturity actually has important impacts for governments and nations. See, a lot of people don't ever think about what is the different, well, there's many, we said size and different things, but one of the primary differences between maturity and immaturity is responsibility. Right? Responsibility. So listen, you don't put a brand new baby into a democratic government in your home. Think about it. It doesn't work, does it? The baby can't handle the responsibility of self-government. So that tells you something, too, about all the people who are concerned about America and our inheritance and our constitution and what was handed to us by our founding fathers. And we, like, we, like, we think, oh, spreading voter you know, democracy is giving people a say in who gets to lead them, that somehow that will save the world. No, it doesn't work. Why don't we listen to our founding fathers? Our form of government is only made for a moral and religious people. People that are self-governed by God's law from the bottom up. Otherwise, you will be ruled from the top down. So babies are put into a government that is governed from the top down. That is what immaturity does. The elemental principles of this world. 
But when people come to maturity and can handle responsibility, they should no longer be in that kind of government. Do you see what I'm saying? And a lot of churches are structured still in that structure to keep people in immaturity. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that interesting? So we need to really wrestle with bringing the kind of structures that, that put responsibility, allow people to be responsible once again. And yet guard it with humility. Because if we're not committed to the king and to his mission and his team, then pride and arrogance, I'm better and I know more than everybody else. And if everybody was as good a Christian as me, the whole world would be saved. Yeah, yeah, okay, there you are. We're not that mature yet, are we? <laughs> but these things are really important. So we need to structure for maturity. And we also need to understand how do we develop all of this properly, right? Because we see here that maturity comes by every member doing their part, causing the growth of the body in love. So we all become more mature and more like Christ as, other, as we give of the gift God has given us and receive of the gift that God has given others. Pretty awesome. And it means we are laborers for the kingdom. So now I got to take a step back and talk about identity precedes function. Because so many times people burn out because they're always trying to do and they don't own their identity in Christ. You hear what I'm saying? We cannot release the works of ministry in the body until our identity is secured in Jesus Christ. You know, what confidence do you have for the future? What confidence do you have that things are going to work out? What, are, what is your confidence? Why? Because we've been born again and we know our Father in heaven. And we know his word and his word is always true. So David slew Goliath because he owned the identity as a member of the covenant people of God. Without that identity, Goliath would have won. David would never have had the courage to go fight him in the first place. Right? Right? It was not a battle between flesh and blood, but between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. Identity precedes function. So that's why we want to read a couple of scriptures that will help with this. 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. Simon Peter, a bond servant. I'm pausing. Identity word. And apostle of Jesus Christ. Identity word. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. What's the first purpose of a worldwide liberation movement? To know God and to know Jesus Christ. To love him and make him loved. What is it? It's not to destroy injustice first. It's to know him, to love him to worship him, to be so in love with his ways and so in love with his truth and see the beauty of holiness and the blue beauty of righteousness and to see biblical justice. And when you see it and own it and understand it and grasp it and have experienced it personally, then you want to liberate the world because it breaks your heart that people are in bondage. You don't go, oh, those wicked people, they deserve it. Or even those wicked people will set you right. It's no, I see the love of God and the beauty of his kingdom. And I want people to know it. As his divine, and then th let's keep going on. Identity. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life. What are you lacking? And godliness. I can't really be godly. None of us can be God. I'm not like the holy man or woman of God or whatever. Hogwash. It's just rubbish. Christ has given us all things pertaining to life. Everything that robs you of life is because you're being robbed of life. He has given it to you. If you don't have it, you've been robbed. You're being robbed. Either by doctrines of deceitful spirits or by folk looking at the mountains Instead of the word of the Lord. I mean, you got to figure out what's choking your life and repent. Another horrible thing. You need to find out what's robbing you of life and repent. 
Quit looking at the things that are getting you into trouble. What do I mean? Like, oh, big, bad, evil world. My life stinks. Whatever it might be. If it's choking your life out, it's not from God. It's robbing you of the life that he's already freely given you. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us, listen to it, great and precious promises. Because what God promises, he fulfills. It's believing and trusting. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. Faith in what? The promises and character of God. That through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature. And it says, having escaped the corruption. But it says, through these, you escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. It's just that passage right there, doesn't it send a vision of victory and of blessing and of deliverance? It really is a worldwide liberation movement. He has given us precious promises. He's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. It's yours when you trust in the word of the Lord rather than what your eyes see or your ears hear. And we've got to feed on those things. Because the enemy wants to come by and undermine our confidence in what God has said. Did he really say you can't eat of every tree? Liar to rob us of life. And then one more, word, one more scripture on identity. Galatians 4, 6-7. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, an heir of God through Jesus Christ. The weight of what was just spoken there, because you are sons, born again, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, by which you cry out, Father, Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir of God through Christ. So the heir inherits all things. Jesus said, all that is mine, the Holy Spirit will communicate to you. He will take what is mine and he will communicate it to you. So that all things pertain, like everything we're reading, it has to sink in and we have to wake up. These are not just quaint words, but they are reality. And it really is a battle of faith that we have to dare to believe. And when we dare to believe God's word and take him at his word, his power starts to flow. It really is that simple. It's almost offensive, isn't it? He has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. He's given us precious promises. And when we believe in them and we trust in them and we develop greater faith and trust in him, his power, his glory, his spirit is manifested through us. His gifts and callings start to just flow through us. We now we have our identity in place so that we are free. To actually minister. See, another one, you know, when I say the whole, a lot of the church is structured for immaturity, it's structured for immaturity. Another reason, because people do not own their identity in Christ. They allow themselves to feel guilty when Jesus tore down the wall of separation. If you really got his precious promises, you would say, listen, it's never been about me. He made the way of salvation and of sanctification. So if I screw up, I run to him, not from him anymore. Right? There's no... Yeah, I mean, listen, the, the, the devil can't win against such Christians. But you see, the problem is so much of labor in the church of Jesus Christ is trying to ease a guilty conscience. So much of labor is trying to feel good about ourselves because we don't. Listen to what I'm saying. So many people do many things to be seen of men. How's that different than the Pharisees? 
Do you hear what I'm saying? Why? Rest precedes power. Identity precedes function. Let this stuff sink in. So many, I've seen it so many times. People are, are ministering to other people because they have a need to be needed. They've not found their rest in the Lord. People claim to, you know, like the apostles said, we're apostles of Jesus Christ. It didn't go to their head. But so many people claim titles because they need a title to feel good about themselves. Because they still haven't found their rest in the Lord. They haven't found their identity in Christ. So many times people are striving after so many things because they have not rested and dwelt in that spirit of adoption by which we are sons and daughters of God. The, I mean, these are the principles that will release the body of Christ to the works of ministry that will deliver the world. People that are still ministering out of insecurity or a need to be important or a need to be valued are never going to transform the world. But only a people that are secure in the love of God, secure in their relationship with Him, insecurity is like a cancer. Not being at rest is death. You, if you are living in death, you can't bring life. So we need to let the truth of God's word so settle in us that there is nothing we can do to earn his love. There's nothing we can do to earn his favor. favor. There's nothing we have to do to get his attention. We don't need to ask the questions whether we have worth because we know what he paid for us. Because he paid for us with the death of his own son. It's when we let this identity ground us. Now we enjoy a relationship and fellowship with him. And it's out of that relationship and fellowship with him that rivers of living water flow. And I've seen it so many times. The people of God so busy about so many things, always laboring, laboring, laboring. And you'll hear them say, but I'm still empty. I'm still frustrated. Oh, but we can't talk about that in church. Well, yeah, we can. Because you're not finding life. And if you're not finding life, you're being robbed. So you need to, if you start with the presupposition, I'm meant to experience the fullness of life. Why am I not experiencing it? And have courage to ask God. Have courage to pray. Listen to what I'm saying to you. If you find yourself, if he says, I've given you everything pertaining to life and godliness, and you find yourself in habits that are not life-giving, don't be afraid to ask, actually ask God, Lord, how do I get out of this? I know you're the way out. Where is the way out? Because a lot of people are not settled in their soul. And people try so many things to settle their soul. They try drugs. They try entertainment. They, and I, I love movies and books. And I love the things in the world. But, you know, you really, things are much deeper than just what are you doing. It's why are you doing what are you doing. Are, you, are, you, are they sanctified with thanksgiving and celebrating the goodness and love of God? Or am I hiding from the fact that I feel miserable? People run from, from these things all the time because they're afraid. They're scared. And they, and they keep looking for other ways out. And there's only one way out. And it's to find your life in Christ. To find your identity in Christ. And until you find your identity in Christ, you will never know freedom. You will never be truly alive until you find your life in Christ. I mean, what is success? Ultimately, I mean, really, it's your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's no greater success than that. You know, I mean, when you breathe your last, all that's going to matter is your name is in there or not. Well, what puts your name in there? Uh, I believe Jesus died for my sins, that he has reconciled me to the Father, and I, can, and I have surrendered my life to him as Lord. Well, how good are you as living, living as a Christian? I suck. Oh, well, that must not be a good Christian, and maybe I won't go to heaven. Your identity is being robbed. Well, maybe you suck because you're a baby in Christ. Babies in Christ suck. 
I, you know, should I, am I not allowed to say that? When my wife gives me that look, maybe I crossed the line. <laughs> Listen to this. What I mean by that is, listen, you read the Corinthian church, and he calls them saints. <laughs> but they sucked. Okay, I became, Okay, I need to behave. There's just so few people. You know, everyone's on vacation, so I can get away with being bad. Okay, yes. I'm trying to get me to behave. No, but you, I'm just trying to get this picture home. Because, you know, he's like... I remember when in Bible college and, you know, one of the professors that when we, when we got into Corinthians, he, he went, there's a stench coming over from Corinth. It's so bad. Even the unbelievers are like, man, that stinks. Well, what is it? A man has his father's wife. Ugh. How dare you call them saints? Why? They're babes in Christ. In immaturity, the heir differs nothing from the slave. The weeds and the wheat look exactly the same until they come to maturity. You can't tell if they're a believer or an unbeliever, a babe in Christ or a child of the devil until they come to maturity. That's why I said babies in Christ suck. I'm not just saying this just to be provocative. I'm trying to bring home a point. That so many people get so focused on their failures as a Christian and they think it's because I suck or because I must not be a Christian or I must not be saved or I'm still going to hell. And maybe it's just because you're, you've never grown to mature. Maybe that's normal for babies in Christ. Right? And, and, and understand that you can be a baby on life support. Paul said you should be mature now, but you still need the milk of God's word. When are you going to grow up? Right? Well, I like being a baby. I don't ever want responsibility. And that's what our whole culture is saying today. I don't, I don't want to grow up because maybe if I did, I'd have to take responsibility. And that's scary. So government, come and save me. Government, come and provide for me. Government, come and take care of me. That's not glorious. That's not the image of God. But that immaturity all begins in the church. Why is the culture going that way? Because the church has gone that way. And the only way out is to bring maturity to the church. And so I, I really just said those provocative things to try to bring home the point that quit focusing on your failures. Quit focusing on your mistakes. Listen, nothing has ever come good out of feeling bad for your sin. Wow, that's harsh. That's true. Listen to what I'm saying. We want, if you repent. Now, granted, if you harden your heart and you don't feel bad because you, you can sin without feeling bad, that's different. But what I mean by that is it's that constant, I stink. Instead of I messed up and I really feel bad about messing up, but I'm running back to God. Does that make sense? But if you just still feel bad, I'm a lousy, terrible Christian, I'm a lousy, what you're doing is you're focusing on your sin rather than on the Savior. You know, like, listen, fix your eyes on Jesus. The same thing. We're chasing the devil. We're chasing the devil. Well, guess what? You're still focused on the devil. Chase Jesus. Exactly. And I'm saying these things because I want it to linger in our soul. That identity precedes function. That rest precedes power. If we're not at rest in our soul, if we haven't rooted our identity in Christ, we will never bring a worldwide liberation movement. So it really begins with each and every one of us resting in Christ, knowing our identity in Christ, and celebrating fellowship with him. And out of that, enjoyment of a real relationship and experience of his presence and love. No, you know, all the scriptures that we may know him. It's not just, lang just words to be read in church, that I know him, that I hear him, that I experience him, I delight him. Delight myself and delight yourself in God and you'll satisfy you with the desires of your heart. Okay, I want to get the desires of my heart. So I'm sorry. It's still driven. It's not alive. I'm trying to let these things come home. Because what I said about all creation groaning, waiting, the revelation of the sons of God is real. And we need to break out of immaturity. We need to break out of insecurity. We need to break out of drivenness. 
and we need to be united as a team because we have so fallen in love with Jesus and see the beauty of holiness and the beauty of his kingdom that we celebrate. I don't care if the fist got the contact with the jaw or the, you know, the feet are celebrating. The whole body is celebrating every victory and the whole body is mourning every defeat. That we find that kind of unity and that kind of security that allows people to even fail and make mistakes and is not afraid of making mistakes and doesn't kill people for making mistakes, right? That's how you structure a church for maturity. That's how you structure a community for life. That's the kind of community that we need to develop here. And, I'll, and the final point, like, like all these, are, it was luckily just has one sentence. Mature the church, liberate the world. Goliath will fall. It really is that simple, folks. You need a strategy to bring down tyrants. You need a strategy to liberate the world from tyranny and oppression. It, God, for some, it, well, really, it is all about worship creates culture. The true worship of Jesus Christ creates a culture of life. And if that life is missing, then it must not be the true worship of Jesus Christ. Something must be lacking. But we don't need to be afraid or ashamed to seek him because he's not going to shove our face in our failures. He's going to invite us into the full... About, why, about time you asked me. You didn't need to be afraid of me. You didn't need to be afraid to ask. I've wanted to set you free the whole time. I wanted to give you the fullness of life the whole time. Just seek me and you'll find. Ask and you'll receive. Knock and the door will be opened. Goliath will fall if we mature the church. If we mature the church, the world will be liberated from the bondage to corruption. Sons of God arise. Daughters of God arise. Identity precedes function and rest precedes power. Sons and daughters of God arise. So with that, I have to give it to the new man awakens to close us up here today. Amen. I really like that scripture that pastor was talking about. If you, if you study that out, it says the whole world is standing on their tiptoes, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. It's an amazing scripture, and it's something that uh, uh, we don't take this lightly. And it, God's given us a great commission to do, and thankfully He equipped us. Amen. And as we hear all these things that we're hearing, and Pastor Bill, I just I just want to pray and just be. I'm just very thankful that I get to sit under under Pastor Bill and the things that He's 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 equipping the church, guys. A lot of these messages you're hearing, it's it's for the equipping of the saints. And uh, I love that he's staying in that and he's continuing to do that and other things. But Lord, we just thank you today, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truths. We thank you. We thank you. We're so thankful, Lord, that you have um, called us sons and daughters of the Most High. I love you even when the apostles came to you, Father, and said, teach us how to pray. And the first thing you said was, Father, our Father. Thank you for that revelation that you gave them and that you've given us. Thank you that, that we know that we are heirs uh, to, the, to with everything comes with that, Father. And we're thankful for the church, thankful that uh, you're doing something in this body, and thankful that the body can work together. And I'm just so thankful, Lord, that uh, you, you don't give us, you don't give up on us, you pursue us, that you can constantly teaching us, Father. We're thankful for the renewed life you've given us, the new life. And we're thankful for the things you're going to do through this body. Thankful that we need everyone, Father. And thankful that we all have come together for your kingdom. Your kingdom, the kingdom is nigh. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, we're always we still doing prayer here. Yeah. Yeah, so guys, if you want to come up and have a prayer or meet over here for some prayer, and or if you're welcome to leave if you want to do that, that's awesome. 
Uh, but if you want to come up for prayer for anything, the pastors will be up here and uh, uh, come on up. Thank you all for coming to Life Springs. Amen.